Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this interview with Dr. David Price, uh, who is a, a trialist with the EMPA Kidney Group and affiliated with the Clinical Trials Unit at the University of Oxford. My name is Janani Rangaswamy. I'm a nephrologist and professor of medicine at the George Washington University School of Medicine and direct the cardiorenal program. Dr. Price, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Awesome. And welcome. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and indeed attention to the trial at the meeting and I'm very happy to be speaking to a nephrologist as well. So, you know, I think the heart kidney, you know, connection has come a full circle and I really think your trial represents a very important addition to that growing body of literature, especially in the SGLT2 inhibitor space and the profound impact it has had uniformly on cardiovascular and kidney outcomes. Now, we were really energized to hear the high-level data reported at the ASN for mm. the main trial with EMPA kidney, but I would love for you to be able to summarize for mm. our audience some of the key takeaway points from the main trial and particularly the cardiovascular outcomes. Okay. So EMPA kidney was a trial which, as you say, aimed to test the impact of treatment with the SGLT2 inhibitor empagliflozin compared to placebo in patients with kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, at risk of progression. Now, how we define that in the EMPA kidney trial is a little bit different to what some previous trials have done in this space. So in particular, we look to recruit patients with an EGFR of 20 to 44, which is somewhat lower than has been done in previous studies or 45 and above, as long as their patients had significant albuminuria. And when you look at the baseline characteristics for the population, we did manage to recruit patients with a substantially lower kidney function, as determined by EGFR, overall. So overall, we, all, we ended up randomizing 6,609 patients across eight countries in North America, Europe, and in Asia, under probably the most difficult circumstances during Absolutely. the COVID pandemic. And the entire team, led by my colleagues Will Harrington and Richard Haynes, really did a spectacular job to guide the trial through that. So in terms of the overall results, treatment with empagliflozin over two years in this high-risk population reduced the risk of a composite, which was kidney disease progression or cardiovascular death, by 28%. And I would say the other notable finding, which Will Harrington covered at the ASN meeting, was that the benefit appeared very similar regardless of whether or not one had diabetes at baseline. Moving to the cardiovascular outcomes, one thing we did realize was that the trial actually had fewer cardiovascular outcomes overall, perhaps than we anticipated at the start. So even though cardiovascular disease contributed towards the primary outcome, there were relatively few events in that space. And so in the presentation here, we've stepped back a little bit to look at three particular outcomes, um, cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization, um, also all hospitalizations for heart failure, and thirdly, a kind of more broad adverse cardiovascular event um, outcome. Mm -hmm. And what you see overall is still for those three outcomes, they were all nominally not significant, whether you counted only the first event or whether you counted all events, uh, which has become very popular in the heart failure space. But nonetheless, the results look very consistent with what you see in the other trials overall. Absolutely. Um, the final thing I'll mention is that we did also look as a key secondary outcome at being hospitalized for any reason. Mm -hmm. Overall in the main trial, again, as was presented at the ASN, that was reduced by 14%. But what we also see now with the new data is that that benefit was in entirely consistent regardless of whether or not people had diabetes or not, whether they had cardiovascular disease or not. And these patients were hospitalized very frequently. So we think this is a pretty important benefit as well. And I want to really reiterate the importance of some of these findings that you just heard about. Uh, especially from the viewpoint of a nephrologist, it's really important to represent patients in that lower EGFR strata. And I think there has been a systematic exclusion traditionally in representing those patients, especially in cardiovascular trials. So I think it's a very welcome addition to the literature that patients were enrolled all the way down to an EGFR of 20. And a third of patients actually represented that EGFR cutoff of 30 or less. And I think that's very impressive. It's not 
not very often that we get to initiate de novo therapies that can improve cardiorenal outcomes in stage four mm -hmm. chronic kidney disease. The other, I, I, Dr. Price, I also I was very impressed with that signal for reduction in all-cause hospitalizations. Mm. And I think CKD patients, you know, obviously we worry about outcomes like mortality. We And the primary outcome, you know, you shared that 28% relative risk reduction. But that was a meaningful uh, secondary outcome. So tell us a little bit more about, you know, why do we think EMPA might have influenced that, and how can we take that signal forward in future research? Yeah, the all-cause hospitalization signal is an interesting one. As I said, one is, it was one of the key secondary outcomes. And when you look at it, the way we categorize these hospitalizations is using the medical dictionary, MEDRA. Mm -hmm. And if you just step back and look at the broad classes within that, there's about 20 or 25 subgroups, if you like, within MEDRA. And you might have expected to see that all of the hospitalizations that were prevented were in one particular group, maybe within the heart failure area, yep. or maybe somewhere else, maybe within the renal sure. um, complications. But overall, I would say the signal is not quite like that. There's a pretty, you know, I would say most of them trend towards a reduction, but only one of the 20 or 25 is actually significant by itself. And so I think it requires further work to understand exactly where the benefit is coming from. I suspect it's really driven by benefits in a number of areas. Mm -hmm. Heart failure is the one we would all anticipate, mm -hmm. but it does seem to be that it's a little bit more widespread more than, than that. More than just the heart failure. And I, I really think that's you know, one of those things that needs to be explored because the burden of hospitalizations in patients with kidney disease mm -hmm. is tremendous and also consumes a lot of healthcare resources and dollars. The other you know, point I you know, wanted to get your thoughts on, are you commented on the mm -hmm. relatively uh, lower rates of adverse cardiovascular mm -hmm. events than expected? And interestingly, the mean EGFR in this trial was the lowest in the kidney outcomes mm -hmm. trials with SGLT2 inhibitors at 37 cc's per minute. Now, we're very familiar with that you know, CKD, especially as your GFR goes down, is a risk enhancer mm -hmm. for cardiovascular events. So what are your thoughts on, on that, uh, yeah. I don't want to call it a paradox, but yeah. on that observation? Well, I think a couple of things worth commenting on. Firstly, with the design of the trial, we modeled the event rate. Mm -hmm. And to do that, we used evidence from different studies. Mm -hmm. But we also had large-scale data from a trial that my colleagues ran some years ago called the SHARP trial which was lipid lowering in patients with chronic kidney disease. And the cardiovascular death rate that we thought we might see was modeled from that, albeit making some assumptions. And I think maybe with reductions in events over time, maybe that's particularly what happened. We also recruited patients in some countries where potentially risk is a little bit lower. I mean, the trial did fantastically well in Japan, where mm -hmm. it recruited 600 participants. So I think that may also influence it. And I guess probably the most telling uh, influence is probably that EMPA kidney had quite, compared to some of the other renal trials, had somewhat lower level of urine albumin creatinine ratio. Um, and we know that that's a particular driver of driver cardiovascular of events. events. Absolutely. And I suspect we also had less patients with diabetes. I suspect those two elements, along with perhaps some, you know, assumptions that we made in the modeling at the start is probably what explains the lower than expected. And perhaps also the, the baseline rate of cardiovascular disease was different and Absolutely. lower in the kidney. Yes. I think those are all some of the nuances that help us understand that. And it's, it's a, just a, the point is that we look at the totality of evidence mm -hmm. and not, you know, and there's always going to be some of these between trial differences, but I think mm -hmm. overall the messaging was very clear. The final point that I want to make, uh, and I really want to congratulate your trial team and the trial, the leadership, the patients, and all the other background work that it took to conduct a trial so impeccably in a pandemic. And I think, you know, sometimes we don't appreciate what it takes to see that through completion. Mm -hmm. And this trial is notable for close to a 100% complete data set. And I think that is really commendable. So I really want to congratulate your team again. What a fantastic addition to the literature. And thank you. Well, thank you very much. And in, in closing, I should also highlight in particular the leadership of colleagues in Oxford and indeed in all the eight countries around the world under the most trying of circumstances. Will Harrington, Richard Haynes, I think, led a trial that we, I was privileged to take part in. So appreciate your positive thoughts on the trial as well. It was such a pleasure to hear from you, from the trial team.
uh, about you know, the conductance of the MPKD trial and the exciting results. So thanks for sharing your time uh, and your input with us today. Thank you very much.